Okay. All right. We made it happen. I'm just sitting here with uh, Jenna Fabian. Nice to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Richie. I think it's a show. I don't know what it is. I just want to talk to my favorite people, like the name of the show. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of just keep going. So thanks for being part of it. I appreciate it. Oh, this is my style, natural, free flowing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I prefer You're... that. that <laughs> yeah. So you are sitting on the floor in Mangafai up north, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. And what are you doing in Mangafai, for those who don't know? Um, so um one of our coaches, Coach Doug Viney, who um, you're very well familiar with. Um, he lives up here, so we're at his spot. Um, a group of us, uh, well, his boxers, his, um, our, our C, uh, CKB, City Kickboxing Boxing team, um, they all came up here as soon as um, the night before we went into level three here in Auckland. And um, I just happened to be up north at my mum's, uh, who uh, lives not far from Dougie, and um, grateful that I'm able to be a part of your bubble. And um, yeah, we're all we're all camped out here and got a cool little crew and uh, flow going. So yeah, just keeping up the training and preparing for upcoming fights. A few of us all have them um, coming up. Oh, awesome! Yeah, so, that sounds awesome. Yeah. I'm I'm je- yeah. I'm quite jealous. I'm yeah. jealous for a number of reasons. Man, it's. Um, like already a hundred times better than the first lockdown that we had <laughs> so so i'm real grateful that like man i get to get to like be around um the crew and um all work hard and eat together sleep together train together like this good 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 energy hard work like good times it's it's i'm really really happy it turned out like that <laughs> Before we get before we get ahead of ourselves, um, you are WMC World Champion, North American Champion in uh, Tabox. You WMC World Champion Muay Thai at middleweight. Is that the weight class? Yeah, yeah that's nice. Awesome. That's a big title, man. That's like yeah. that's like the organization. Um, how long have you been doing Muay Thai for? I've been doing training Muay Thai since 2012. My first fight was in 2012 um so yeah is it like eight eight years eight nine years uh well sorry i first started training toward the end of um 2011 and trained for a year and then my first fight was in 2012 um in muay thai so yeah eight nine years now and where did you start i started in thailand uh at phuket um at tiger muay thai Oh, rad. Yeah, yeah, famous camp, huh? Yeah, famous camp. And back then, it was um, it was the only, like, uh, destination camp, I guess you could say, um, uh, around at that time, more spe- specifically in that area, Phuket. Um, and it was much smaller than what it is today. Um, and MMA hadn't even gotten, their, their MMA program hadn't even got off the ground there. So, I, yeah, I've I seen it. I seen it when it was just one ring and trees and um, a lot more downscaled, I guess. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And what made you start? Because it is such a, you know, like you've been doing more eight years. It's one of the hardest things you can do with your life. What what drew you to such a such a lifestyle? Um, well, I was working. I was very young, fresh out of high school, and I was fortunate enough fortunate um, enough to get a really good job um, in media at the time, and so I was working uh, in advertising and marketing, um, and I was paying well. Um, it took me to, from Auckland to uh, Sydney, Australia. So I got transferred over there, and um, actually an ex-boyfriend of mine we were together, and we went over there together and um, started our young lives. And um, anyway, yeah, living the Sydney life and uh, work hard, play hard is kind of how it goes over there. and. Um, on paper, we seemed like a successful young couple doing well, living on our own, living in the eastern suburbs of Australia. Um, I was working for um, a company called News Corp. He was playing professional rugby league, and we were doing well. But um, um, and our families were all, you know, we all the talk at um, at Sunday lunches and things like this. But <laughs> um, you know, a few years uh, doing that, and I just wasn't happy and. Um, I'd always been an athlete and always been active. My background was in track and field. Um, but 
um, it was awesome. It taught me a lot of really good um, skills in that secular world, um, especially as a young adult coming through and um, it taught me a lot about myself and how to handle myself and um, just grow and become um, a lot more uh, professional in a lot of aspects. But um, it was work hard, play hard. I was getting a lot run down and I kind of just lost myself a bit um, over the years, kind of living that lifestyle, that kind of corporate lifestyle. Was that like a lot, a, of lot. a lot of part? Yeah, a lot of partying in the weekends. Yeah, and... of, yeah like a lot of work functions and, um, you know, social life is, you know, um, being young and at that age. And so, um, but I was losing myself and what I had grown up loving and being a part of. And I knew what kind of, um, uh, like, yeah, what I, what, 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 like, set my soul on fire. And anyway, it wasn't until um, I got into a really bad car accident in Sydney. Um, and I was out for three months. I'd broken collarbones, things like that. It was the first time I'd been in a serious car accident. And um, anyway, it took a lot to recover. Um, I was bed bound for a little bit, a very depressing time, thinking back then, all these years ago now. Um, and then um, my boyfriend and I at the time, who I was, who, I was living in Australia with we had broken up um, through that and so it was kind of like I took off to Thailand with um, a friend of mine and um, yeah threw ourselves into this um, this training camp that friends of ours had referred us to at Thai Muay Thai and um, man it was the first time traveling like um, abroad um, to Asia and yeah that's how it basically started but I had no background in like martial arts um, specifically Muay Thai specifically um, nothing so it was a totally new experience for me I was you know complete beginner um, and had to start from 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 the bottom didn't know what you didn't know you didn't know how bad you were until <laughs> you know years later when you when those videos pop up of your <laughs> sessions and you're like oh my god this is <laughs> hopefully these never surfaced <laughs> and so no yeah so that's how um it it sparked and it got started but it was a couple of years after that that i started to um that i just changed my entire life around to um to pursue muay thai and fighting I love that. That is such, it's like the ultimate gangster eat, play, eat pray, love film. You know, did you know that film? It's like, it's, it's, you know, like, it's like you go on like a yeah. wonderful, like, kind of yeah. like, but, uh, wow, that's amazing. You had a car accident that could have killed you. You'd just broken up with your boyfriend. You were partying too much. Imagine like smashing far too much alcohol and whatever. Oh, yes. And, that was and the, then, yeah, my first real, like, and I call Sydney, like Sydney to me is truly like a second home. I, I love it. And I love those years that I had there. Um, and that's, but it's like where I, where I, where I spent my real adult years, like my first adult years, like I yeah. moved over there when I was 19 and, um, experience, and like, I had a very regimented life up until then. Um, you know, my, my sport track and field, like kept me kind of very busy in school, obviously. Um, and then getting this job kept me very regimented and, um, and quite, quite, um, sheltered, I'd say. Um, up until that point in comparison to a lot of my friends who were like dabbling and stuff real early on in high school as you do you know even younger and um, I was quite sheltered from that thankfully looking back um, but it all that partying and all the drugs and all the you know dabbling and all that stuff and all that, that like uh, happened for me a little bit later like in my early 20s which is a good thing you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, like uh, you, some people get into drugs and alcohol like real young and it becomes kind of who they are for a while, you know, yes. if if they never, you know, if they get out of it. Yeah. So was growing up, um, how was growing up for you? What were your parents like? Yeah, good. I was raised um, by um, some amazing women. Uh, my mother and my grandmother were um, my sole kind of, yeah. Um, my sole parents growing up, um, my mom and my father split up when I was two. Um, so I never had them um, as like a dynamic uh, growing up. Um, my father was still around. He lived, uh, he's from Waikato, like King Country. So he was always based there and I'd, I'd visit on holiday, at school holidays or whatever. And um, yeah, he was, they were young when they hooked up and had, had us and um, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, my grandmother, who's uh, 
um, Samoan and my mother's that side. I was, I was raised closely with that side and my father being Māori. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up kind of a lot closer to, to, to my island side and yeah, grew up out west in Te Aratu. Oh yeah. yeah, west side. Yes. Yeah, west I'm side. from I'm from West Auckland as well. Yeah. Glenid and represent. Yeah, yeah. Tap, 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 uh, I know it was Tiaratu North back then. Now it's, yeah, not Tap in. Yeah. yeah, now it's Tiaratu Peninsula. Got it. Got a bit bougie, but um, yeah, no, it was it was amazing. You know, like grew up, um, born and raised, and then we moved out to um, Balmor uh, Mount Eden, and I went to Balmoral Intermediate. Um, and then uh, later on, so from girls, and by that stage, we were living, uh, we had moved to central Auckland, um, Greater and Ponsonby. Oh, yeah, it worked. Yeah, so, yeah, I was kind of scattered around. Did you um, grow up with, like, a strong, like, did your grandmother and your mother have, like, a strong sort of mm, sense of far Samoa, like, you, you, you speak Samoan, and, like, those tr cultural traditions were passed down to you? Yeah, um, being raised by my grandmother, um, in hindsight, now, I was very fortunate to have her as one of my influences, main influences, a very strong, strong Samoan lady um, who migrated to New Zealand. Um, and uh, yeah, she didn't speak a lick of English. Um, she was actually brought over by Aggie Gray, who um, owns, who's now passed, but um, owns the Aggie Gray Resort. And yeah, uh, yeah in, in Samoa. And um, uh, she she was one of the first one of the first in her family to um, come over to to New Zealand and migrate and then later on her other brothers and sisters and um, nephews and nieces and things started to migrate over and they all kind of situated themselves around Auckland uh, and some yeah all over really but um, so very hard fought woman she married um, she remarried when she got to New Zealand uh, my grandfather um, who was uh, Kiwi. Uh, and uh, it was a tough time for her because she was a very attractive woman growing up, very beautiful featured. that were German Samoan, so she, she was very pretty but didn't speak a lick of English. At that time, you know, um, the, you know, had to deal with a lot of um, racism and, you know, um, things of that nature. So uh, she fought tooth and nail to um, get ahead and to raise her family and to be um, accepted, you know, and to, um, yeah, she, she had a very strong, strong mind and will and backbone. Um, and, and, you know, I think growing up, a lot of our, us grandkids and her kids too, um, kind of found her, found her a bit hard, but, she, you know, that was kind of her survival instincts being a, being a migrant. So, um, I'm really grateful for having her, um, as one of my, you know, backbones growing up. That's amazing. Um, I think I, and I truly believe I get my fight and mm -hmm. the world that I have found more as I've grown up and, and come through life like from her. Mm. So, yeah. I've talked to friends who are of, you know, Samoa and Palangi descent or they're, you know, uh, got m m mixed cultural heritages. And some of them found that growing up in the 80s and the 90s, which I guess is a little before you, you, your, your time, but they were kind of never felt like they fit in. They were kind of yes. like either too white or they're too Samoan and they kind of were trying to have this difficult dance between two worlds. Was that true of your experience or how did you find out between, you know, I guess, Palangi European Eurocentric New Zealand culture and then your, your home life of Samoan culture? Yeah, absolutely. Like that's, that's, um, it was, exactly kind of how it was for me um yeah you were never uh wide enough <laughs> to be um you know uh white or deemed as you know um Balangi or kiwi and you weren't Samoan enough you know you were, like that term like plastic Samoan was thrown around and um growing up like you just kind of like oh yeah okay accepted it but then I you know later as I've and I've grown, I'm like, what even does that mean? Plus there's someone, I'm someone, <laughs> and my family is someone, like, you know, and, and you know, just became more at one with, with not having been raised in the islands, and that doesn't water down or take away what it means to me to be uh, someone, you know, and so um, it has come with years and um, later throughout life, but 
uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it was that it was that mix of like, where do I sit, and and who am I? You know, <laughs> like, cause yeah, like which which one uh, am I allowed to be? You know, according to other people. And so you definitely had those had uh, feelings of like that mixed kind of yeah confusion. Um, but yeah, later on in life. Yeah. Do you um, think things are getting better in that regard now? Do you think society is positively shifting to accept people from different backgrounds? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think now that um, the society and the world in general are becoming a lot more um, intermixed and intermingled, um, it's a lot more common these days. Um, so it is becoming a lot more um, acceptable and you get people of all sorts of, you know, six different things, seven different things are from, from both parents. So you're getting real fruit salads, you know, in the mix. And, and, and yeah, and like socially it's becoming a lot more normalized. <laughs> yeah. Fruit salad, I love that. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I read somewhere once that the ultimate goal is for everyone to date everyone and sleep with everyone so we're all just this wonderful shade of beige you know like yeah. you know like yeah that's how that's how the world's playing out to be i think um but yeah but no i mean now these days man i, I hold all my sides and and cultures um so so proudly and so close to me and traveling with the world like i have um, and, and not just traveling, but actually being um, amidst other cultures and living and breathing um, other cultures and other environments and things like that has only made me have a deeper appreciation and, um, and sense of like um, pride in who I am and where I'm from. And so I had to, that, that if anything helped me come back and, and go back and really look more into what actually I am and where I'm actually from and all those different different sides of it so so yeah it's been a journey <laughs> yeah I appreciate you sharing that with us thank you I think it's important to talk about you know I think uh I think if you're white or white passing you don't necessarily consider the fact that uh people who have a migrant story or uh of a different background they're not reflected in the world necessarily the same way that that we might be, you know, like yeah. his, at least historic. Like that is shifting, you know. We yeah. are seeing better representation and advertising and TV and yeah. yada yada yada. But yeah. like, I grew up with like lots of white people on TV and lots of white people in advertising, and yeah. um, my friends who are people of color or have different backgrounds, they're not. You don't see yourself in the world, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, and that, yeah, um, I think that like that was it like growing up um even even as a young athlete coming through and even um to when I started fighting which um doesn't seem that long ago um but in comparison to where it's gone where it is currently now like there, that's exactly it there was no representation um when I was younger of anyone that um looked like me or that was selling like me there was a couple I remember Beatrice Farm when now being someone um, and she, she went to the Olympics, she was a, you know, Olympic and world champion. And um, I was like, cool, she's someone. And there were people like, you know, in the All Blacks and things like that. And you'd be like, and like, so a lot of men growing up were my, um, uh, you know, models? Yeah, 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 yeah. I looked up to them because firstly, not even, you know, culturally, there weren't um, many women, you know, kind of um, in those fields excelling. Um, and 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 uh, being represented um, so uh, I think definitely more so now like I was saying there's a lot more of it now um, and it's and it's kind of coming up so which is which is awesome which is cool yeah so you've got this twofold thing there were not many uh, I guess someone role models uh, and also like no someone female role models in fight sports for you to i guess l look to huh is, is that yeah what you're saying? And, and yeah not even, and, not, and yeah and not even someone like like um just mixed brown you know like um yeah and and my first one that i saw that i was like that kind of remotely like 
uh, resembled anything like that was Miriam Nakamoto, um, who was from America, and she was half, I think she was part black, part Japanese. Um, and uh, she actually beat this girl who was at Tai Muay Thai. Um, it was actually my trainer at the time's girlfriend. Her name was Claire Hay, and she's an ex um, world champion as well. And they fought, um, and I was like, who is that girl? She had brown skin like me, and um, you know, athletic and tall looking and things like that. And I was just like, so she was someone I drew myself to, uh, you know, not uh, subconsciously, like not realizing because I was like, wow, she's a, she, she, she kind of like resembles me or like, you know, she's brown. Wow. She's tall. She's a bit like, like things like that. So that was kind of the first female that I saw that was like, of um, you know, ethnicity um, doing what I, you know, was, was uh was um aiming to do so yeah but then yeah so then take it to now like there are so many girls um now more so but like that that are out there and coming up and i've um, been brewing for some years now and, and doing their thing over here so i feel like i'm just catching up on the scene over here so mm. that uh, and it's beautiful like i love i love now being a part of that and then being back home and having that time and appreciation for it. Do you consider yourself a role model now to young young woman? Um, uh, you know what? It's only since I've really come back home that I've really truly uh, like felt that. Kind of. Um, <laughs> you yeah. kind of look like you don't want to be a role model. <laughs> You're like, no, mm, because, role model. Yeah, because I never set out to be that. Like, I never had a blueprint to do what I've done um, or to be doing what I'm doing. Um, I just had a relentless passion and love um, and naive kind of obsession with it and, and, yeah, passion and love for it. And so I was just chasing it. I was chasing it. I was chasing it over the years and took me all over the world and in some of the lowest spots, but I just loved it that much that we made it work and we found a way each and every time. Um, but the fact that, I, I, you know, a lot of girls look up to me, it's a blessing, really. It truly is. But, like, I, I don't want to be a role model because because – that means people look at you in a light like you can't fuck up, like you can't be flawed. And I'm flawed as fuck. Um, just like this, you know, I'm a human. And sometimes people put you on this pedestal and expectation that like you don't struggle or you you do everything perfectly. And, you know, just being honest, like I'm learning and figuring it out, you know, as I go along and I always have. Um, and, you know, of course, I'm a lot more refined and a lot more wiser and a lot more together our certain aspects now but you know like new levels new things mm. and um, you're only 30 years old and 30 is young like i, I, I think, feel so yeah <laughs> no i'm telling you i'm i'm 40 years old like you know but like when i was 30 i thought oh i'm so old i remember yeah. thinking, oh, man because i've been fighting for so long and yeah, like, yeah. i felt yeah. old and i was like oh you know but looking back i'm like man i could have fought for 10 more years like uh you know i, re yes, I retired like, six, you know like your yeah. body is capable of far more than i think we give it credit for and i think part of that's because we um we use old as such a pejorative negative term these days but actually as you get older your body gets stronger but you have the wisdom uh, perhaps you're not as fast when you know past 35 or whatever but um you have all the experience and that's from the athletic side of things but also like in some ways, life gets better as you get post-30 because you have a deeper sense of who you are, as you've been talking about, and where we come from, and we have all these yeah. lessons that we've learned, right? It's a, it's an So I guess I'm trying to tell you, like, 30 is a fucking great age. Like, you're, like, it's, like, the best, you know? Like, you're so young. You've got everything, like, physically as an athlete, but you've also got 30 years of wisdom to add on top of that, you know? Uh, and that's 100, like, you, yeah, articulated that perfectly because that's exactly that's exactly how I feel um I think about my years back then I don't regret them for a bit and like all the things I've done and mm -hmm. the wild years you know when I was when I was a party girl and all this stuff and um I look back and I'm like oh man 23 or, or you know whatever 21 or whatever and I'm just like now I wouldn't want to be that person <laughs> yeah. again 
there's no way just just where my where my mentality was at where i was as a person and and of course all those things shape you to you know where you are but um man i think that and like i love where i'm at and i love how at the rate that i'm growing and learning and the mistakes that i'm making or have made and and how i how i'm growing from there yeah we've got enough experience now to know that that's how it goes and just like okay a bad spot or a rough spot or a fuck up or whatever you know it's like it's it's um on the other side is great lessons and great um growth and evolution um in, in your personal journey so so it's just like you yeah you just become more seasoned and more at one with all that it's what i like about martial arts is that huge transferable life lesson right like you lose 100%. a fight because I don't know you you lose a fight because your clinch isn't strong you haven't got a good ground game or you get you got a terrible leg kick and then you're like that really hurt I don't want that to happen again so you go back to the gym and you do leg kicking for three months fight again and win with perfect leg defense it's the same with life right you're like yeah. your relationship you know you're dating you're like why am I always dating these sorts of people or right. why do these right. patterns emerge in my career and then you figure it out apply the lesson and then things get better mm. um yeah 100 percent. so many so many um yeah just translations um uh, from from fighting uh that that uh, to, to real life and and i feel like that's why fighters and a lot of the fighters that i've met all around the world and, and and all the ones we know you know like um are a lot more disciplined and a lot mm. more pathetic and a lot more integral than most people and you know it's funny you know the, the the perception of fighters and fighting um it's it's knowing them on their personal life is the, the most gentle most calm most um yeah empathetic and integral people that you'll meet you know in general um most of them because they know that they're humbled by through the sport and through life and um the lifestyle and so you know it, it teaches you about yourself at a faster rate i believe so uh, yeah I, if, if you weren't fighting you know so those things mm. um really yeah they 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 uh fast, get fast tracked a lot a lot i agree more. man I think, yeah I, to, I totally agree there is a humility that comes from from the whole process win lose or draw it's a yes it's a larger than life growth experience and you do it enough. It, like you say, it exponentially speeds up how you develop as a human being. Yeah. How was, yeah. how was your um, family with your fighting? You know, you, you're saying you come from a reasonably strict traditional, uh, Samoan background and were they going on, I guess, an atypical journey to become a professional fighter. Yeah. That, you know, um, they weren't, they didn't understand it at first because it wasn't something that, I'd grown up as a junior doing, um, you know, so they didn't even know the world and know that I, I, I was an athlete my whole life, but I uh, ran track and field, but, you know, fighting and what, like, <laughs> you know, this, this, what the hell is Muay Thai, you know, <laughs> they couldn't even pronounce it properly at first kind of thing. And what you're moving to Thailand, you know, that, that it was a, it was a hard pill for them to accept and swallow, which I totally, uh, in hindsight, like, um, understand just so that I, I didn't come from that um you know and and they weren't familiar with that and um like i like i mentioned before what i was doing prior to starting my time fighting and things like that um you know i was on a nice kind of safe um path um you know i was working in sydney living in sydney paying my own way i'm working for a big corporation you know, um, just bought my first, you know, cars and th you know, just all these things on paper that being to be, um, uh, like successful, successful yeah. in person and living in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, blah 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 blah, going out with a football player and I was just like, man, they didn't, they had no idea that like, I was, I was killing myself inside, like the shit that I, that was really going on behind the scenes was just like, just not a way to live, and I don't, I don't think I would have been able to handle it for, you know, had I, had I stuck with it uh, for, for many years. So who knows, you know, and, 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 and fighting really true. And I don't know if people say this, but I feel like fighting really truly did find me because um, I wasn't set up to do that. You know, that wasn't anything I ev ever grew up like 
wanting to be or wanting to be a part of and um these life events these fucking really at the time like big life events um led me to fucking thailand you know like yeah yeah yeah. you know and um and and a muay thai gym and i was i was just there to do initially like there's some fitness classes going on and it's going to do some boxing pads for the first time kind of thing like just like me and my girlfriend at the time were just like gonna have this girl ship and like and then I got immersed in it man and got enamored with it basically and everything to do with it and it's just like and then I just freaking changed my whole life and world and sold everything up and uh, many years of struggle many years of like living off nothing living on couch surfing living in basements on mattresses in, in those years you know in Malaysia in the most randomest fucking places I ever like just people wouldn't even believe you know but I just I just some people know some of the stories but like just not not ever like not even my family fully know the extent to like what I where I've been and like the things I've done and so yeah it's it's it saved me from a very like pretentious guarded um judgmental life you said pretentious yeah yeah because all these other things seem to matter to me all these superficial non-important things especially when i had moved to sydney and i was living amongst and just growing up and being around your friends and going out and looking you know having certain things or feeling like you need to have certain um material things to 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 look a certain way and to always be you know looking at presenting yourself a certain image which is totally fake you know and not you but you know you're young and you think think you know it all you think that's the way yeah and and some people some people some people never get out of that a hundred percent you know like some people like they've got more money and more money and say like i get a newer car and i'll get a nicer gucci handbag and i'll get longer yeah. eyelashes and i'll get a bit of fake tan and i'll do yeah. more bench press and take more hgh so i look like yeah. i'm meant to look in like and, and and this is what's going to make people like me this is how i get girls or this is how i get um friends and it's so superficial and it's so um empty and mm. and um and fake and so it's just like I, yeah, I love it's, it's I love that sad. you're sitting on the yeah. floor. I love that you're sitting on the floor in track pants and you've trained this morning and you've yeah. given up all of that, right? And oh, mate, it's so rough. It's so yeah. rough. And I had to put on a hat just to kind of cover myself a little bit. <laughs> looked a bit funky. But, <laughs> but um, um, yeah, no, and I, and I totally yeah. was not that person, like, you know, just a young teenage girl kind of, um, yeah, just just going through and yeah like um just just so influenced by society and all that and um and you know I went the total opposite direction like when I when I chose to move to Thailand for those years and um and truly learned so much from the from like my trainers and the Thai people and um you know Mm -hmm. sitting on the floor eating with them um going back to their hometowns and their home villages amongst the rice fields and being really accepted and, and 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 like bought in by you know to how they live and how it is for them and uh, you know going toilet on the floor like on those little squat you know like <laughs> yeah, those, those, I know those them the, I know them well yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly I, and and going out to the wharf at night and just singing on a guitar and just nothing but like a, a Leo or a Chang beer and and your teammates and, and your trainers and those are some of the most beautiful, uh, pure times of my life. Like that, I was just like, "Wow, I'm so happy and I'm so grateful." But not many people even be able to relate to, you know, what that does, like, or how that feels, you know. Yeah, I do. I do. From hey, so from Thailand, came back to New Zealand for a minute. Yeah. To city yep. city kickboxing, world's number one MMA gym right now, and you yep. continue to to fight. For for them, but I had a quite a long period living in, uh, well, just out of San Francisco and Dublin there at Combat Sports Academy, CSA yeah. gym. Yeah. How yeah. did that happen? How did you get, how did that come about? So, yeah, uh, like after Thailand, uh, I, well, I got a flight, an opportunity to, um, 
uh, to fight for Bellator for kickboxing. And then um, Eugene Berryman, he's my cousin. And um, he he had come, uh, he, him and Israel actually would frequent to, to Thailand a lot and um, come visit a few of the boys there. And they came over um, and checked me out over there. And then um, we'd always be in touch, of course. And, you know, um, then I got this fight opportunity and he was just like, we talked about it. I was like, I'm not getting what I need here. It was, um, there wasn't enough kind of um, trainers that specialized in like kickboxing and things like that. It was the Thai trainers, obviously, who are amazing, but they just, it was, you know, it becomes very, um, very mundane, like very the same. Same old, same old. The same, so just like traditional Thai training. Traditional, yeah, like, yeah. Like king kicks, king kicks, yeah, you kick just power. Work. Yeah, I yeah. I wasn't like leveling up. Um, you know my game and and i needed that needed that um kind of yeah that 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 new you know knowledge of like use how to how to use things properly and just the system that um is embedded and is you know world class you know you know firsthand you've been a part of it so um yeah came back home and then um yeah fought and trained and was at home for a year and just um yeah at city kickboxing and um then i got approached by uh the owner and head coach of uh, csa gym uh in dublin california to come over because at that time even though it was like three four years ago women's fighting still wasn't to where it even is at this point it's grown exponentially like even in the last three four years you know um to where now women are headlining uh the number one promotion you will see um but like that at, at that point you know, it wasn't like that. And he just said, look, like you're a talent and um, you've got so much potential, uh, but you're, you know, like being based in New Zealand, there's not many opportunities for you. You need to come to the hub and be in front of these people and um, the right people and the right, the, be accessible, you know, to, to, to go to the next level if you want it. And he just, he put it to me and I, I was just like, oh, that's all very well. Like, I can't get to California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's expensive. Uh, yeah. Brand, one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yeah, I definitely can't um, even spend a week there with how uh, my, how my current uh, financial situation is. I was just like, and then um, yeah, he set it up to with one of the um, you know, with uh, some of the other um, investors in the gym to where I was like house staying with them and you know and uh, Eugene. Um, gave me his blessing to go and he, he forced me to go I kind of was a bit hesitant and a bit unsure and didn't know what to do and thought wow like there's this opportunity but how do I know it's going to be for me and, and I don't know anyone I don't know anything over there and um yeah he, he just said look you've just got to go pursue it and um what's the worst that can happen you don't like it and you come back home and you've always got a home you know he's like you've always got us you've always got uh you know you're just like but to not do it will be doing yourself a disservice and um he's like you just got to experience it and go go see what's up and so, so how long were you at csa for like three and a half years almost four years oh three and, and, you, half years, yeah. and you won your wmc world title with him yep yep so that's where i won my um my title, world title wmc um and then i got signed to uh the Professional Fighters League or PFL, mm -hmm. um, which is um, an MMA organization um, uh, over there, and um, yeah, had my first season with them last year, and sure. still currently signed to them. Obviously, with all this COVID stuff, I know things have been um, pushed back to 2021, but the season's still going ahead next year. And, um, yeah, so so you've had three fights for PFL. For those who don't know, PFL is the organization of New Zealand's like perhaps most famous kickboxer Ray Sugarfoot Sefo yes. who who was like an icon for me growing up when I when yeah. I started kick when I started Muay Thai in 1997 he was already like the man and he was at Balmoral Gym and now he's in America yeah it's an amazing promoter right with yeah some big yeah. investors and I think Kevin Hart's part of like behind PFL and you got yeah. Randy Couture and yeah oh he's got yeah and he's he's done so amazing and so well mm. um, and um just got yeah and i think even like a really big music company is kind of like yeah um big investor and big ceo is all a part of it so um yeah it's it's the, they've kind of tried to structure it like 
um, an NFL um, style um, format to differentiate themselves from like the other promotions, UFC, Bellator and things like that, um, to, to, to have a, like a playoff um, style tournament. Oh yeah, sure. For a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so it's been sick, and um, like the last two seasons have been huge successes. So, um, and everyone's gotten paid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good because it happens, man. Like I remember the yep. tournament Super League in Europe, like in the early two thousand, the brother Jordan Ty and others yep. go and fight these world class yeah. fights and not yeah. get their. It's nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, it's it's. It's crazy. Those things definitely happen in the sport, and it's so unfortunate. People we all know, you know. So it's a, it's um, nah. So it's cool. It was cool. And to be honest, like um, you know, when I signed to them, people were like, "Oh, is it legit? Or are you gonna, are you gonna get paid?" And, you know, like, "Oh," did it. but everyone from the season beforehand had gotten paid. And to be honest, I was just so desperate to fight, and the opportunity itself, I was just like, "Yo, I, you know." T- like of course yeah. I, I of course I do want to get paid, of course, like, but it was just it was at that point I was just like, this is an opportunity for me, like um doing it regardless. I do it for yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like um it's like your training partner, um, Mark Timms at City mm-hmm. Kickboxing. Mm-hmm. He was in this holding pattern for like a year with no opponents, couldn't get fights, you know, like Man. Tra- training the ass off. I felt so bad for him, but hopefully yeah. we'll get busy for him. But it's yeah. a similar sort of situation, right? Like Yeah. Yeah, you've got the drive, but there's no opponents and no opportunities. Yeah, that's yeah. hard. Yeah, and man, it was like it's like yeah, you just uh, mentioned Mark, like same situation. You're training your ass off, and I'm in another country, especially for this and to fight and everything. And it was just like, and I was a training partner for so many, and a lot of other girls who were like with similar weight classes that I was training up, and I was not not better than, but I had a lot more. You know, yeah, I was better than. So like. You know, and it was just like in terms of like a certain skill set, you know, and they were getting, I'd see them getting opportunities, and and like, and I mean this with everything that I was like jealous of anything they did, but I was just like, I want my shot, like I want to try all the things <laughs> that I've been training and training and training and training, preparing everyone else for, and helping it, and that, and that's what that's how it goes, you know. It's like there's your time, and then there's your your, your teammates' time, and it kind of goes in ebbs and flows and things like that, but. It really forced me to um, force me and test me to trust my process and trust, um, believe in myself and, and get and you know uh, make sure that uh, I didn't come home empty-handed. You know, yeah, word. That, was, that was my biggest motivation. That was my biggest motivation over there. I was like, I'm not coming home. And, and as much as I wanted to come home, and I'd say that was probably the most homesick I've been over the years. Um, was that stint in America? And um, there was just that that thing in my head um, whenever I would get um, yeah, tested or homesick or start to feel a type of way, uh, I'd be like, you haven't done shit. Like, you you make this worth it. Like, so you ended up having three fights in the PFL for, uh, for CSA, huh? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two. And then the last one, I, I made it to the semifinals, but I... Um, I uh, th- I didn't make weight, and so uh, I was sent to the hospital before that. Yeah, so that was a bit mm. of a fuck up, but uh, <laughs> man. Yo, uh, making weight is one of the hardest parts that um, people who aren't in the game, I don't think, really understand. What happened in that circumstance? Um, so basically, uh, yeah, prior to that, everything was going well, and I was on track um nothing like my numbers and everything I was closely monitored we were closely monitoring everything um you know uh, up until the date and um I always had um because of the because I was fighting so regularly like every two months um I I I cut a lot of like I'd cut seven kgs in a night um and for me who's six foot tall who's already very lean at that stage um and doesn't hold a lot of body fat at that point. Like it's a huge cut. But I would, I would gangster it out. So I'd it out. I was like, there's nothing new to me, and I've done that even prior to that. You know, like I'm strong up here. Like when it came to, then I found my flow and I found my the place I would have to take myself to. You know, and um, so I cut that, and then the night before it was like eight kgs, and then 
or cutting for like eight, nine hours. Um, and usually we had a process down pat done for the cut. And um, for whatever reason, uh, after that first, our initial process, um, I still had like, I think I saw it like three kgs. And that it was like, that's a lot. Like, I was like, yeah, was something like that, two to three kgs. And that's a lot at that point when I had already exhausted everything that we were doing. So we went back to the hotel. We've made a plan. We found a late night sauna because um, I'd do it the night before. And um, and we started about 8 p.m. By this stage, it was about like midnight just after. And then we went back to another sauna. And I did like four 20-minute sets plus 30 minutes bike plus a 30-minute run. Um, so this was the second lot. And then we um, went back and I still had like, I still had, I think 1.5 kgs after fuck. that and um it was just it was just slowing the fuck down you know and i didn't want to leave the sauna and i didn't want to leave the bath so we went back to the hotel the last resort was the bath and then we went to the bath i was in there i was in there yeah, for, for, just just quickly if you're not a fighter the bath is when you get in a really hot bath you jump out and you sweat and then you get back in the really hot bath and you get out and you sweat because that fluid that you're sweating out is weight on the scales, right? It's the worst. I hate the bath. Like some people prefer the bath and prefer sauna like that is my worst. And anyway, at this point, you know, it was like I think it was like four or five in the morning was still up. Um, they ran the bath. I got in. I just found a place. I was so exhausted, so depleted by that time that I wasn't really saying anything. And that's only because I was trying to conserve my energy, you know, and so I wasn't saying anything. I'd just put my thumb up, like, I'm good, I'm good, and I'd check on me, and people were talking to me and just keeping me up. It was all good. Um, we rechecked again, and I had, like, I think I was 0.9 off after that first bath for, for an hour. And, um, and they were like, they then everyone left the room and left me on the bed like I was sweating and or, you know whatever and I'd stop sweating um and everyone left the room and I was just like where's everyone gone kind of like looking up looking around and they all come in and they're like yeah we're gonna call it and I was like no no don't don't like I was like I just need a rest I was like give me a rest because we had time you know like well yeah we weren't weighing until like 9 a.m 10 a.m so there was like still a few hours I was like just let me chill and, and then we, we can go again but my head coach at the time decided to call it and you know it was what it was and then um I got up and uh went to go like take the bounce off and I I fell and smacked my head like on the, yeah on the edge of the bath like on a ceramic you know uh, bath and so um yeah and I was out of it and then um, I thought I was okay, but then I woke, and then I woke up, and I was actually in the hospital. Oh, wow! So um, I, I would have to say it's probably for the best you didn't fight, right? Like if you're that dehydrated, you fell over. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> you're like, I love it. You've got the attitude. It's a fighter's attitude. You're like, nah, nah. I could have, I could have been fine. <laughs> I've, 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 yeah, and, and I'm not saying that like that is not healthy when I'm 100. percent I'm yeah. not trying to be a hero. I'm not advocating That's it. A big it's tough though. It sounds yeah, like a tough it's, cut. It's, yeah, that was, that was a tough cut, but I've had tough cuts before. And um, I fought my ass off, you know, like I, I fought through, like a lot of ugly shit has happened prior to that too, but we made it, you know. Um, and, and, I, and I fought and, um, I cut, you know, I probably wasn't in the best health. Yeah, all. but still, yeah, I get it. I get yeah, the same. That, that, like, who knows, but in, in saying that, like like the point you're making too who knows some the worst could have happened to me too yeah in there you know and i could have been hit with something that usually i'd be fine and totally rattled or totally you know who knows who knows we'll never know <laughs> so yeah but the, the it's definitely like that was a tough tough experience to um come back from and um and uh you know pull it all back together and jump back on the wall yeah, because you've, um, you've fought Muay Thai since then, haven't you? Since yes. Then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How, yes. how was that? That must have felt like a real satisfying experience to get back in the ring after that. Yeah, totally. Totally. It was. It was. And it was, um, and it was cool. It was back home. And uh, that was my first experience fighting back home. So that 
if anything, it was like a really exciting experience for me. And I was like really like a, a sense of like real gratitude to be able to do so because yeah, first time for me and um, coming back to my roots of Muay Thai and just, 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 you know, putting things together and, and again, and then just, just practicing all the, all the, the new things that um, I'm adapting to and learning and all that. So that was cool. And um, hopefully outside of, uh, up on the other side of this lockdown that I'll get to fight again, like another Muay Thai. Sorry, that one that, uh, the one just was actually kickboxing. Oh, it's kickboxing, not Muay Thai. Yeah, all right. yeah. but um, hopefully maybe next time um, this year, um, it'll be Muay Thai. What Maybe do you prefer? Or in October, hopefully. What do you like better, Muay Thai, kickboxing, or mixed martial arts? Oh, um, now MMA, but then Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah, MMA's, yeah, oh, man, that's just, that's, I love that sport so much. Um, but Muay Thai being my base and my roots has really helped set up for all that and that transition. Um, but I love the growth and the learning from all the aspects of of mixed martial arts it's 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 tough but it's so rewarding at the same time and i love that um i'm learning all these other components of fighting it's so cool i love it i love wrestling i love ground control and the grappling and it's just you know like it's so humbling because you're a fish out of water <laughs> in comparison to people who are more experienced in those elements than you are and um but it's it's also finding your own flow and style to put it all together and find your game and what works for you and um how you use each component to your advantage and to your game so i love that i love that learning and that 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 side of the journey when you were in america did you find that there were i don't know what was your big cultural difference between American training and American promotion of, of female fighters and your experience in Thailand or New Zealand? Yeah, a hundred percent. Totally different. Their culture is totally different to what we know here in, in New Zealand. Um, we're a lot more down to earth. We're a lot more humble. We're a lot more um, authentic. Um, and those are things that I struggled with more, uh, more so than anything while I was over there. Um, I remember three months in calling huge, uh, like, oh, I want to come home. I'm done. Like, this isn't, this isn't for me. I've, I've, you know, I'm training my butt off and I'm doing everything coach says and he's awesome and he's cool, but I can't get down here. It doesn't, you know, <laughs> and he was just like, look, sit, write it out. He's like, have a fight there first and do a camp and. He was like, don't, don't come home just yet. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, three and a half years, four years later. But um, yeah, that's, it was, that was, that was tough to um, navigate and find my way through that and how to handle that and how to survive that side of it because it was totally, it was totally like eye-opening and kind of disheartening in a lot of ways I think, because there was, you know, being based in California, uh, there was a lot of like um, female fighters um, more established over there and coming through and everything. But there was a big push on, and female fighters specifically, like with the sexualization of it and the sport. And it just didn't, never sat right with me because I know where I come from and I know how much that's deemed as, um, you know, like full of shit. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? You mean like as in like uh, the sexualization of it as in that female athletes would be promoted because they were quote unquote sexy compared to a way that male fighters might not be? Or like, can you explain that to us? Yeah, I think just like a lot of it was aesthetics. And if you were aesthetically pleasing or could, could sexualize um, your the sport and you're and 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 use that either in conjunction with or some but for the most part it was overriding <laughs> the actual like skill and, and 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 legitimacy of 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 the fighter and, and the sport and mm -hmm. and that that just didn't um i just found that very hard very difficult to um 
to be okay with that and be amongst that it just it didn't sit right with me because you know as we all know as far as we go in there all that shit doesn't matter and, <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 word. and it's not something i've ever had to worry like, about or any male fighter has to worry about right like do i look good you know yeah yeah but i think i think guys deal with um other things like um yeah it, how presentable they are and they've got to be some sort of personality like that it's an entertainment sport and yes. um you know that's where it's that's where it's at and that's and that's how it is and and, and that's what gets the eyes and the money and whatnot and i totally understand that or have come to understand that side of it that business side of it but yeah i just i shouldn't want to be used as like i don't know i just didn't want to be um just over sexualized or exploited to to a to a point like now if you can use that and do it in conjunction with with the sport and and your skill and your passion and love for it by all means i i, I love women we possess such beauty and such um you know, I, I feel like that there's a total time and place for it, and I love it. And I love being uh, dressed up and feeling beautiful and feeling sexy. I'm no, I'm no different. It's just, it's just that was overriding the the other stuff, um, the stuff that was <laughs> more important, like your fights and your training. And um, and and once those two kind of got blurred and mixed up, or I'll see that happening to other girls and um, that I was around at the gym, I just uh, and, and kind of used as like a like um, a popularity kind of fucking contest that was just like fuck, like this isn't this is not what like why I do this and I know like what what uh what drew me to the sport in the first place like um, and no one should be ashamed of and I just want to make it clear like no one should be ashamed of like being putting themselves out there or um, uh, you know, expressing their sexuality and expressing their, you know, um, their aesthetics and things like that. But there, there is a way to do it um, and still stay classy uh, and um, stay true to you and, and what you do. But I just felt like it was becoming gimmicky and real fucking almost Hollywood in a way like that. I just, I just, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't sit well for me. And that was part of the culture that I, kind of was amongst them yeah well with it yeah no I appreciate that I appreciate that um I think it's a really interesting perhaps not interesting I think it's a really important insight like anyone watching this or listening to this to to understand because that strikes me as kind of quite a double standard like like you say like you know male fighters do have uh expectations placed upon them too when it comes to marketing and talking a big game or you know yeah, but at the same a, time, adopting or or being a certain persona. Your persona, or, uh, yeah. But, but it's I kind of, as, it's not as direct, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, whereas if you're the you're the prettier or the sexier girl and or whatever, you get more opportunities, more endorsements, more yeah, uh, yeah, more whatever. And I was just like, dang, like. So, so would you say that, like, uh, a female athlete who might have been, like, aesthetically pleasing but not as good a fighter, not as technically proficient or didn't have as last ratio sure would get more even, opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally that was happening. Totally that was happening. Or more attention, more care, more hand-holding, more, yeah, more um, avenues to... to uh, endorsements and opportunities and things like that as opposed to someone who yeah maybe wasn't aesthetically pleasing um but had had the the experience and years and um and skill you know all all behind them but because they weren't playing the game um didn't didn't um didn't get as much um opportunity or exposure and that was quite disheartening and that that didn't even happen specifically to me like that was happening around me and i could witness that and, and i was just so i uh, you know i was i was really disheartened by that and, and it kind of did make me because because i was in it was my first time in america like and and what i was there for it, it for for a minute there i was kind of like oh is this how is this what the next level is is this is this what this 
is like is this how this works now and it kind of did put it like it, it kind of made me a bit jaded to be honest um because man experiences of like big wigs or people uh with money or opportunities or um uh, endorsements and things like that like you think would be cool but turned out they just wanted a piece of you and thought they could thought they could you know kind of like get to you like that or thought that you would sell your soul almost you know to to get that oh. when you say a piece of you, you mean as in like they wanted to date you or hook up with you in regards yeah, they, Is that... well they make those innuendos and look like i'm no i'm no you know um delicate kind of flake like i've been around men and guys all my life and and i I don't mind, you know, like that stuff that people shoot the shot. Like I'm no like kind of like, I don't get offended by this, this shit like that. But it was just kind of like, I guess, I guess in hindsight, I, I was a bit naive to the fact of things and um thought that it, you know, and especially as you come through, and especially as a female, it's harder and harder to to um figure out who's there to help you mm. and who wants something from you, you know, and um uh it's harder to to navigate that and um so you'd come in with pure intentions um thinking you know it was um more of a networking and, and partnership thing and then you know it turns out like certain certain situations like in their mind they had other motives and and that was really really fucking disheartening and you know um again happened to other people i know too so i was just like other women and so I was just like, yeah, I, I got a bit jaded from that whole experience because I had come across that prior to, so, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't have the language, really. But I'm sorry that, that that's something you have had to experience and countless other women continue to have to experience when all you want to do is pursue your passion. Yeah. In yeah. the same way other athletes do who happen to be men it's a really yeah. shitty double yeah it was shitty from the that. and like again could you try I, again is that right sorry yeah sorry my story just turned on that was weird uh, um i'm and yeah again, i'm sorry I'm no, I'm no like delicate little you know what i mean i've been around i've been in a man's world for ages and i am one of the boys you know kind of thing so i'm not i'm not too delicate to things like that and um, but it was, yeah, it was disheartening when it became like the premise of why someone wanted to be, um, have some sort of involvement or affiliation or said they want to help you and, or, or wanted to be a part of what you were doing. And then it's like they pull the rug underneath, out, out underneath you and be like, well, this will come at a cost kind of thing. It's just like, man, fuck, like, that's oh, not cool. That's dark. Mm. that's really dark yeah i appreciate yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that i think i think a lot of guys out there need to hear that i mean men in particular you know like uh i don't know if they're necessarily aware of the fact that a lot of sisters have to deal with that sort of experience and how it yeah. can shape 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 someone yeah uh, yeah it made me very um very a lot more guarded and a lot a, a, a bit um a bit uh uh what's the word like uh a bit, a bit, yeah a bit rough you know like it made me um very uh um yeah Defen just, just like defensive defensive or... yeah not non-trusting and like that that took that away from me a little bit a little bit you know like yeah. it um whereas i am i've got so much love and so like uh, my personality and i love people and um and and I, I love to see the good in people and, and try to, you know, just, just like give everyone a chance and things like that. But it made me very wary and you know, trusting of like a lot of a lot of things. Um and so yeah, and it and it kinda of put me off the sport for a minute. And and to be honest, when I first got back I kinda of had a word to you. I just gotta put this out there, like it, only he knows this, but like, yeah, I just I sat down and I said said can I talk to you you know and he was like yeah whatever. and then I just said look I, I, I don't think I want to do this and he was like what like you're just 
only getting started like and you've got a big opportunity now and like why the hell you know he's like what is it what is it is it you know and he named off all these things it's like is it the nice and just and, I, and at that point I didn't I hadn't processed it properly um and I didn't know how to to um articulate it but I said I'm just jaded and it was it was from all that background politics and things that I happened to witness and um experience you know being overseas and uh I just was like oh, this isn't this isn't this isn't what I what I what I loved about it or why I did this um, and pursued this. I said if the, if this is kind of how it is, um, shit, like I'll I'll do something else. <laughs> you know. But he's uh, he put you at ease. Yeah, it's totally. He's like, look, like you're just gonna need time to settle in. He's like, you're at home now. You're amongst your people and people that you know. Um, and love and trust and 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 um, you just need to settle and we'll get your ducks back in a row and you know you're 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 home now so just just ride it out and then we'll we'll come back to it and yeah so it was and just so no, and, right. <laughs> and so I guess that brings us to to now which is um you know obviously fucking up the program but you're still signing with the pfl and uh, you got a muay thai fight coming up here locally in um at Rio, new zealand yeah but moving forwards you're going to be pursuing mixed martial arts with 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 the pfl huh like that's you got some fights scheduled there or how's that looking? yeah yeah so um next year 2021 the uh, million dollar tournament uh part of the women's lightweight division um that kicks off may next year and so I'll be fighting every two months, um, gunning for my spot um, to be the champ and win a million dollars. Yeah, so, girl. Can you take me for lunch if you win a million dollars? Hard. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I got we'll, go to, we'll go to possibly food court or something. I'll treat yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> mean. Cool. Yeah. I'll get, to, yeah, I'll get an extra curry. <laughs> we can do that now, Richie. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so that's... Um, that's the plan and then yeah just get as um you know hopefully I, I can get two fights whether that be um definitely one will be in Muay Thai that's on the cards um but whether um I take an uh, like a boxing fight or another kickboxing or Muay Thai fight before the year's end that would be ideal and then um and then yeah but you know all background and um all things prepping for um next year's mission <laughs> oh. Um, Jenna, thanks so much for taking an hour out of your day. I really, really appreciate that. You've shared a lot, man. We got pretty deep, and I really, I, gen I genuinely appreciate you, um, yeah, talking with me today. I think anyone watching this is going to um, gain a lot from it. So thank you for being so open and um, sharing your experiences. No, thank you. You're, yeah, thank you for being so easy to talk to, and um, I hope <laughs> oh, it was like okay. <laughs> no, it was amazing. It's amazing conversation. I think I think I think there's a lot to be gained from open conversations around some of the stuff we talked about today. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Uh, hopefully, I can see you at City Kickboxing sometime when yeah, uh, when sure, it's back this over. Blows over. Yeah, this is back to normal. Hope or well, yeah, we find out this week, huh? What's uh, yeah tomorrow. Yeah, we would. All right. Well, give my love to Dougie and uh, the brothers out there. And um, I'll talk to you soon, all right? Yeah, cool. Thank you, Richie.